All right, hi guys. So next uh, speaker is is Ben Sagadi, and he um, um, previously worked um, at Microsoft as a solutions architect. Is that correct? And then uh, now he's working at Databricks, uh, just in town here. And then he'll talk about um, MLflow and this, the uh, a life cycle of ML and AI. Over to Ben. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to be here. So um, I'll get straight to it. Yeah, this is um, MLflow. It's basically a machine learning lifecycle management platform. Um, let's talk about why it's, it exists, why people are actually investing so much time building it. Um, primarily because ML work, especially development, pipeline development, is complex, right? Um, for those all of you practitioners, you would know that it's a, an iterative uh, process. It really is a cycle, right? Uh, you have a data preparation phase, followed by model training, uh, model evaluation, then on to deployment, and, um, and basically you're constantly catching these metrics and seeing whether your, your model's drifting or not. Hence, you have new raw data coming in and potentially going back and uh, doing a, running through your whole uh, training and deployment uh, cycle over again. There are dozens of tools, open source tools out there for each of these various phrases, uh, phases, right? Um, I, um, you know, primarily we talk about R and the, the Python uh, ecosystem. Um, I'll talk about Spark um, a bit more in a second. Um, but as a whole, each of these steps themselves are iterative, right? So you'll go through for the data preparation, you'll loop in there with new features, right? Same goes with, of course, the model training. You're going to iterate on that piece as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of parameters to be um, tracked, and that's, that in itself is, can, be, can be a challenge. Then you need to sort of make all of this scale to uh, not just you know, many servers, but large groups, right? Uh, we're talking about uh, bringing in siloed teams. Uh, onto one uh, onto one flow, right? So for data preparation, you might have so data engineers involved. For the model training, it would be the data scientists. For the deployment and the collection of uh, the new raw data, that might be the DevOps folks, right? Um, so this um, life cycle needs to scale out to all these various teams, okay? And on top of that, you want to impose some sort of governance, ideally, right? Um, this is rarely done, uh, but um, MLflow will, will, uh, is, is assisting in changing all this. Um, and there's also a model exchange, so ability to, say, train a model with one open source framework, yet deploy it using another one, right? Train in TensorFlow, deploy in PyTorch, as an example. Okay, so that's that's the complexity we're trying to address, and uh, MLflow is here to the rescue. Yeah. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's an it's open source project. It was uh, um, started by Databricks, uh, open sourced in June of 2018. It's a set of conventions, specifications, tools, CLI libraries, and a community, of course. Um, currently, all development is on GitHub, right? Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of, lot of different uh, folks involved. It's already been integrated in um, three or four commercial software, you know? Has. Um, so quick, quick uh, design philosophy, um, API first. Yeah, so everything has an API. It's it's meant to be really uh, uh, um, easy to to set up programmatically, right? It is about uh, automating the sort of lifecycle, right? So everything needs to be um, done programmatically if needed. Uh, it's modular. We'll talk about its its various pieces in a second, but um, 
again, you can uh, take what you need, discard the rest, yeah. Um, easy to use, I'll, I'll demo that in a second. And um, yeah, so right now it's actually available from within PIP, within Conda, uh, on Conda it's on the, uh, on the source uh, forge side. Um, good, good, good. Oh, by the way, APIs for Java, Python, and R. Yeah, didn't, didn't get to mention that. Yeah. And yeah, this is open source in that yeah, it's, it's a big problem. So we're trying to really get as many contributors to assist given their problems, right? We want to have this, this tool sort of address everyone's needs and hence we need more input and more contributions from others. Okay, so let's get into the actual components. Um, there are four, one is, is brand new, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, that's the registry, but um, the major ones are the tracking projects and models. So tracking is literally tracking of everything. The code used for the data preparation, code used for the modeling, all the parameters used within the machine learning algorithms, the corresponding model performance, Results are tracked. Any sort of um, environment configurations, whatnot, all of that's tracked. Then you have the the projects component, which basically bundles all that the, all those articles into sort of um, into um, I, should, I don't want to say container uh, into a package, which can be then redeployed um, anywhere such that you can uh, go ahead and reproduce the exact same results, right? So uh, projects aims for uh, reproducibility. And then on the models piece, you basically have two um, open source components integrated with MLflow, namely mleap and onx, O-N-N-X, which are both uh, basically converters from one machine learning framework to another, so again, Using mleap and onx, you can go train in, say, TensorFlow, but then deploy that model, convert the model to PyTorch, and ultimately deploy it as a PyTorch model. Yeah. So a um, bit more on the tracking side. Tracking your, again, you, you have a few uh, concepts here. You're tracking parameters. These are actually generic key value pairs, so it could be anything you like. Actual metrics. These are performance metrics for the models. Artifacts, these are actually, these could be just any generic files. You've generated some image for uh, the results of your model. You can bundle that in. And of course, the source code, yeah. Um, projects themselves, again, this is that bundling of the, the code, the configuration, and the data sets, such that you can readily re rerun, re-execute the entire uh, environment and reproduce the same results, whether it's uh, done remotely or um, on your uh, local setup. Yeah. So here's an example of what a project would would contain. Um, basically, you, you always have some sort of say YAML um, config file, um, your main, your your modeling script, and all that. You can actually just you know, do an ML for run. It'll find main and it'll kind of go get what it needs from the YAML and uh, set up your environment for you and yeah, you're up and running with that um, entire uh, workflow reproduced. As I mentioned, yeah, so with, uh, with models there are uh, just you have these mleap and, uh, and onx, um, the ability to actually convert. Furthermore, you can have it set up such that um, you have the native model, so in this example, uh, TensorFlow, right, that's saved as is. And then you can have a converted one as a, as a, as a generic Python function, which can then be run by, with, by any Python environment, yeah, say uh, in the Docker or on Spark, which I'll demonstrate in a second. Yeah. Deployment environments, um, basically anything you can imagine. So um, Java should be included there, my apologies. 
Um, but we often have actually deployments done on, on Docker containers. Um, I'll go demonstrate this one in a second. We'll do some batch deployment uh, using Spark. Um, and there are even some other cloud services uh, out there, namely Microsoft Azure's uh, machine learning service and AWS's SageMaker. Okay. So, yeah. It's lightweight, open platform, integrates well with existing frameworks, and uh, it has its own server, by the way, yeah, running in the background, keeping track of all these of this logging activity. And uh, within Databricks, uh, uh, you, you have a managed version of MLflow available. Okay, so if I may, jump into demo time. Right, it was demo time. Okay. So here we are in, so this is Azure Databricks. So Databricks is a managed Apache Spark environment available on Microsoft's cloud, Azure, and uh, AWS. I'm on the Azure side right now. Um, I have a little Spark cluster going. By, by little, I mean minimal. It has one worker. Yay. Um, let's take a look at libraries. I do have two libraries installed, MLflow, which we, uh, I fetched from PyPy, and Koalas, which I'll talk about tomorrow, if you guys are around. Uh, that's basically a Pandas uh, API for Apache Spark, yeah. So this library, MLflow, is installed on this uh, Spark cluster, and I'm gonna jump into a notebook. So this is a Databricks notebook, if you're familiar with Jupyter or Zeppelin, this should be, uh, yeah, this should be uh, very, very easy for you. Same thing. It's an HTML-based uh, IDE. And um, for your, those practitioners or those who've, who's, who've studied machine learning uh, a bit, you're probably familiar with this data set, the Iris data set. Uh, um, some call it vintage data because it's from the 30s. Um, yeah, uh, I really like it because. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So let's go. So I've actually connected to that cluster, which I've named Fast Asia. And uh, let's do some machine learning and keep track of uh, all these experiments, right? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going and load this iris data. Yeah, it's a CSV file. I'm going to read it in into a Spark cluster. I'm going to do a little bit of renaming and uh, ultimately just display the first, uh, first 10 results. Yeah. So this, this is the first execution on the cluster. It takes a, give it a give it a second. As soon as the, da the data set is up, um, we'll we can get started with uh, putting together our pipelines. Basically, getting getting the um, our data prepped for machine learning work. I hope it's not the internet here. Okay. So as soon as that goes, in the meantime, we'll continue on. So next stage, uh, um, once we have the data set in memory, uh, we're going to do a couple things. First off, uh, you'll see that uh, the one of the fields there, label, uh, excuse me, species, actually is a string, and we'll have to address that um, because um, what we'll be using later on for, for our machine learning uh, work, um, the Spark machine lear learning library, demands that all data be in numerical format. So we'll go ahead and convert, uh, that is map those strings to, um, to integers. Okay, whoops. There it's going. Um, that's using the string indexer. And there's one other step that needs to be done, vector assembler, basically taking all the uh, features that we see and basically crunching them up into one vector. And that's what uh, basically we'll have uh, as our um, prepped data set. Okay. So here we go. Again, those of you familiar with the Iris data set, yeah, this should be, should be very, uh, very old site. But basically you have uh, four fields and uh, four, four length fields. These are sepals and petals. So if I'm not mistaken, the Big ones are petals, the small ones are sepals. Yeah? Well, which ones are the big ones? These. Excuse me, no. Sepals are long ones, these guys. Yeah? And what Fisher did uh, back in the 30s was go ahead and um, basically make these length and width measurements 
on these petals and sepals. And he himself was a botanist slash statistician, so he could identify the species of these uh, flowers, and he went ahead and constructed this, this data set. So uh, actually has three species, Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. Okay, so we're gonna build a model that's basically um, an expert system, which is fed these lengths and widths, and with that, it would just predict the, the species of, of the, the flower here, okay? That's what we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna do this, the, the mapping of our species to an integer, that's label, so these species have now been mapped to label, and our, and our original features have been vectorized into that vector there. Okay, and it's this label and features columns that we're going to feed into our uh, machine learning algorithm. So, a uh, very quick run through the data science process. Uh, I just want to talk about the act of uh, uh, splitting your data set into training and test sets. This is basically to, uh, to um, make sure you have a sensible way of evaluating model performance. So, typically, you term you hand over the majority of your data set for training purposes and what uh, remains, what's held out, is used for testing. Okay? In Spark there's a very simple function for that, it's called random split. In this case I'm going to give past two-thirds of the data set over for training, yeah, that's this side, um, and the remaining third we'll, we'll keep for testing. Okay. Good, good, good. Here comes the ML flow piece, okay? I'm just gonna import that in. I'm also gonna import another extension from it, uh, the, the Spark pieces. Uh, while we're there, we'll go to, uh, we'll pull in um, a couple things from Spark's machine learning library, namely a decision tree classifier and, uh, um, um, and, uh, and also a, a uh, multi-class evaluator, okay? I'm building this little helper function here called train and evaluate, and it's gonna take in two model parameters for this decision tree, max bins and max depth. Okay, so here we go. I'll start off with an ML flow start. Yeah, everything following this within, within that uh, indentation is going to be logged by ML flow. Okay, so I'm gonna construct this, um, the constructor for the century classifier and pass it these max bins, max depth parameters which were fed into my helper function, correct? Um, I'm going to then train my model, fit it, that is, to the training data set, data frame, and out will pop this uh, decision-tree classifier model. Do a little print, okay, just for the sanity check. And straight afterwards, we're going to use that same model to make predictions on the test set. Okay, that's this transform function here. You can think of it as predict, uh, as you would in, say, scikit-learn. Okay, um, so we've now made predictions. That is, what are we predicting again? The species of the flower, given the lengths and widths of the sepals and petals, correct? Um, so we've built a model, we've made predictions, but uh, we need a way to basically um, uh, gauge its performance, right? Um, I'm gonna use two separate metrics, one being accuracy, the other one being F1 score. You know? So uh, yeah, do, we'll have those generated. That's basically comparing the actual species versus the predicted ones, you know, different, different techniques for uh, measuring how well a model is performing. And then comes all the logging, okay? MLflow, I'm gonna log parameters, namely, as I said, it's just a key value pair. Yeah, I'm gonna log those, uh, those model parameters, max bins and max depth. Uh, I'm also going to log two metrics that I'm generating, accuracy and F1 score. You know? At this point, I could have even logged any sort of other artifact that I would like, code, any uh, images I've generated, whatnot, doesn't matter. You, know, you can uh, log all that. I'm also logging the actual model itself. In this case, it's this pipeline model and I'm just giving it a name. Okay? 
So that's my little helper function. And by the way, this thing returns a model at the very end. OK. Now let's go ahead and put this guy. Let's use it. So here we go. I'm actually going to use this train and evaluate. I'll pass it um, a max bins value of 15 and max depth of 2 and have it build a model for me. OK. Good, good, good. There we go. Accuracy is 0.90. F1 score is 91. That's a pretty good model. Um, can we do better? I'm just going to say uh, go ahead with max depth of 3. Just, just alter that one value there. Parameter. It's a model parameter. Yeah, much better. 98%. OK. Uh, I can continue this. Um, a 4. I haven't altered the max bins. Uh, looks like that didn't make too much of a difference there. Um, but you know what? I've already forgotten the first few scores. But hey, that's OK, because that's what MLflow is doing in the background, tracking all that activity. So here are the two things. Within Databricks, you actually have a little sidebar for MLflow. It'll actually keep track of the, the three runs I just ran. Yeah. Um, so actually, this one point, yeah, these two are pretty similar. But better yet, there's a whole UI. So this is part of the MLflow server. OK. Give it a second. Again, this is this what you would run in your, um, as on, on your CLI, it would be MLflow space UI. And you get this, this environment up and running. And here you can actually come in and compare results, right? So if I want to say, let's say, sort these guys by accuracy, I could do that. No. Um, OK. Good so far. But I want to go a little bit crazier. So so far, yeah, I've just done very simple changes of one parameter. Typically, in real machine learning work, you might have dozens of parameters that you want to search through to find the, 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 the best model uh, available, right? Uh, so you wind up having a multi-dimensional parameter space that, uh, that you like to explore through. Um, in this case, I'm just going to go with a two-dimensional one. So let me close that guy. Let's do something silly. So there's a right way of doing this and a wrong way. I'm going to do the wrong way for the sake of simplicity. Um, I'm going to do a, f a brute force search. So we'll do a, I'm going to actually basically just do a couple for loops. I'm going to put my mic down for a second to type. Let's do uh, for max bins um, in the range of, say, 5 to 16 every 2 for max depth. to five, let's go ahead and run our, run our uh, helper function. OK? So I'm actually running through, how many is that? That's going to be five by uh, five by five, 25 runs here, roughly. You know? So it's chucking away. Um, I don't have to pay too much attention here, because again, this is all being tracked. I have a whole user interface for exploring the results in just a second. Yeah. So give it a second. But yeah, we're doing a, a full, uh, you know, a pretty aggressive sweep. Um, the right way of doing this is to do cross validation while doing your parameter tuning. And if you're using Spark ML, MLflow will capture all that activity as well within your cross validation runs. Okay. Um, yeah, it's still going. Ooh, look at that, bam. <laughs> Might have a champion right there. Okay. Okay, that's done. Good, good, good. Let me jump back into my UI. Now let's do a little refresh real quick. I did, uh, no, it was a range. 
It was a range, yeah, yeah, I give it, uh, yeah, five to 16 in every two steps, in intervals in increments of two, yeah. Um, so now we have a bunch of runs, all right, right, look at that, nice. I want to compare all these guys together now, boom. Okay, let's compare. So you can actually go in and say, uh, look at one parameter uh, dimension at a time, say max depth versus accuracy, that's fine. We see that max depth of a four is faring better. But what we, well, but we actually were searching a two dimensional space. So it makes more sense to actually go ahead with a contour. Yeah. Okay, so this is Max bins, actually let me do that around. Let me do that around, max bins versus max depth. Uh, oh, it's a bit, okay. F1 score, yeah, okay, so where are we getting high? So four, we're doing, we know we're doing pretty well. Um, so there's max bins on the, on the x-axis. So it looks like there's a few scenarios where, so we're trying to get to the lighter shade, right? The lighter shade, meaning uh, accuracy of one. So lighter is better. So it looks like these pockets are actually doing pretty well. Uh, for some reason here, this whole bit around max bins of 13, for some reason isn't faring well. Okay, good to know. We'll avoid that for when we, when we actually do our final uh, model run. But yeah, we've identified sort of uh, um, corners within our multidimensional parameter space that that are good for this specific ta task. Okay, maybe. So, yeah, max depth of four, and then max spins anything above, say, 13. Good, okay, that's, that's the little demo. Um, so with, with, uh, with, uh, without the managed uh, version within Databricks, you still get all this, the ML flow UI, you just don't have a, you just have a, you know, you're just doing a local host, uh, I think that's 5,000. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And by the way, um, so you can find me on LinkedIn, GitHub, and Twitter. I have posted all the slides and the demo code on GitHub. So if you go to this, to my GitHub repo, uh, my GitHub account, there's a Foss Asia 2020 demos repo. The slides and the, the code are all there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Look at the one I set up.